Good morning. My name is Pastor Mary Elizabeth Hanchy, and I am one of the pastors here at United Church of Chapel Hill. Welcome to worship. Welcome to the worship of the living God on this second Sunday of Advent. Many of you have received service information from the church office, and we want to remind you to look at it, to see the announcements, and the prayer requests that are found there. We are so glad that you are here. We light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ. And the Lord has promised in the days to come, the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling will lie down together, and a little child shall lead them. Good morning. Our Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. In it, there are words of comfort to the Israelites returning from exile. I'm reading from the New International Version. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All the people are like grass and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout, lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Our gospel lesson is from Mark chapter one, verses one through eight. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For much of my life, the comfort ye from Handel's Messiah has been a staple of the second Sunday of Advent. Year after year, it marked the way for me. I can hear that clear voice in conversation with the strings and the harpsichord. 
the long unaccompanied runs of that tenor voice and the support of the strings that dance with it. This week, as I have sat with the scripture from which the comfort ye comes, the scripture that is our text for today, I have been listening to it at home and in the van and singing it in the shower. One of my children asked me if I am just listening to it on repeat, and my answer was yes, yes I am. It buoys me up, it makes my heart soar. There are so many good one-liners in Isaiah 40, so much potential for inspirational posters and mugs and t-shirts. A few weeks ago, as we prayed for our nation, we sat with part of Isaiah 40. Do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. That was so uplifting. And there's that bit that promises he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Those who hope on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. Also so uplifting. And then in today's text, we find not only the cry of comfort, but that poetic imagery of lifting up the valleys and making straight the path in the wilderness and that bit about the Lord's word standing forever. In fact, my mother-in-law has a towel with that verse on it. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. Isaiah 40 is generally full of uplifting promises, line after line, which is why, as I was reading in preparation for today, I was intrigued to come across a warning from Walter Brueggemann against getting caught up in the generic evangelical buoyancy of this passage without going deeper to see what else was there. There is that bit about Jerusalem having paid her penalty. It's this line about telling Jerusalem that her penalty has been paid that, that always sticks in my chest a bit, actually. Cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. This is so harsh. I, I think we could all use a bit of buoyancy these days, no matter how generic it might be. But let's see if we can't understand a little bit more about this passage and that warning and what we might take with us instead of generic buoyancy. Isaiah is a really long book. It's generally understood to have two different and distinct parts. The first part ends with the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Babylon and God's withdrawal of favor from the people Israel. There is war and violence and devastation. And Isaiah 40 is the first chapter of the second section, it announces that the atrocities are over. I suspect that many of us perceive all sorts of atrocities and violence and warfare, and that we yearn for the promise that they are over. Significantly, most scholars believe that the second portion of Isaiah was written much, much later the promises of Isaiah 40 are set about 160 years after the end of chapter 39. Brueggemann calls this the long pause, the very long pause between the fall of Jerusalem and the words of comfort. In American history, looking back 160 years puts us in 1860, the year that Abraham Lincoln was elected president. Using that length of time as a reference, 
for how long God was absent, according to Isaiah, is stunning. It reminds me how very limited my own sense of time is. And what was this about? What is this iniquity and pardon about? Isaiah understands the devastation of Jerusalem to be a direct result of the failed public faith of the people of Israel, of their allegiance to things that were not God and that were not of God. And we can wonder how we might read this story in our context. God is still God, and the church is the inheritor of the line of Judah. What might Babylon be? These days, and throughout history, really, Babylon is used to describe all kinds of chaos and adherence to bad ideas. Even within the scriptures, Babylon is already being used to describe something else entirely. The book of Revelation refers to imperial Rome as Babylon. How else have you heard that term used? To what ideologies might folks adhere these days that are not of God? What might we trust to order our lives when trusting God seems too difficult or too easy or nonsensical? How do these things seep into our public lives? and our private lives, and our life as a community of faith. And I have to admit, I struggle with this idea found not only in Isaiah, but in most of the prophets, that Yahweh might will destruction. That is certainly a complicated theological question, one for the ages. We know how very important it is to read the entire story of God in our lives and in all that has come before and not to just pick out one passage or one verse or one way of understanding God. This is the essence of Brueggemann's warning against seeing only the buoyant part of this passage, skipping over the iniquity and the suffering and the pardon allowing those to be part of our reading, let us then name and carry with us some bits of good news. First, when we consider Babylon and what ideologies might hold sway over us, we also get to ask whether there is life outside of those ideologies and whether that is good news. And I think the answer to both of those is yes, yes. There is life outside of bad ideology. And yes, that is good news. When we are stripped of those ways of thinking that tangle us, then we are better able to come near to God. Second, God's proclamation is one of comfort. Comfort, comfort my people, says God. No matter how long the pause may feel, or be between devastation and comfort, God speaks comfort in the wilderness. And this is always good news. And third, this passage is quoted in the Gospel of Mark. That is good news because it points us to a new telling, a new understanding, a new covenant, and it points to our baptism. Mark 1 starts off the very beginning, the very first words say, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And after quoting Isaiah, after quoting the bit about making a path in the wilderness, it says this, John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Look, the entire story of God prods us to remember that we are called to turn 
from things that are broken, that we are called to repent. We are called to turn away from those things that tangle us up, that keep us from being faithful to God. When we acknowledge those things that bind us, when we decide to shed those things that tether us to this world, when we confess our brokenness, we are forgiven. We are always forgiven. And facing this part about iniquity and pardon is a part of approaching the inbreaking of Jesus into our lives again at the manger. It undergirds our buoyancy. So my friends, when you hear Isaiah 40, perhaps in the soaring voicing of Handel's Messiah, or in the voice of a child reading the scriptures, or in the boisterous hymn that we sang today, be buoyed up. Be buoyed up by the promise that our iniquities are pardoned. That is not general evangelical buoyancy. That family of God is the good news of Jesus on whom we wait. Comfort ye, comfort ye, says our God. So may it be. Would you join with me in prayer? Good and gracious God, the ground of peace and the fountain of understanding, we give thanks and praise for your wisdom and mercy, for your strength and steadfastness, for your faithfulness to creation and for the gentleness of your presence. Come to us in this season, loving God, as we await the gift of Christ Jesus, 
that your grace might grow through peace in the midst of our divisions. Grant that each one of us might sense a turning in our hearts, leading us with humility to love those with whom we differ. Grant, too, gracious one, that social unrest may be calmed by the advent of justice, that those who have suffered may be relieved, and that all who are tired might find rest. Deliver, O God, those who live their lives on the margins to the center, that our lives might be rightly ordered by your righteousness and peace. Through Christ, who is the promise of our salvation. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is right to give our thanks and praise. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from the north and from the south, from the east and from the west, to gather at the table of our Lord. According to Luke, when Christ Jesus was risen and at table with his disciples, he took bread and broke it and blessed it. And he gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share in the feast that he has prepared. Therefore, with all of creation, we sing God's praise. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we may be Christ's body for the world. Amen. We give thanks to God that on the, the, the eve of Christ's death and on the night of his betrayal, he said, with his disciples, and giving thanks to God, he took bread, broke it, shared it with those among him, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, Christ Jesus took the cup. Pouring it, he said, This cup is a sign of the new covenant, my life poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this cup, remember me. Let us pray together. We give thanks, gracious God, that you have refreshed us at your table by the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth out into the world, rejoicing for your justice and your peace. Through Christ we pray.
as you go from this time to love and serve the Lord. Remember that the God who created you, the God who is with you even unto this hour, the God on whom we wait to burst into our world with love again at Christmas, is a God of pardon and a God of comfort. So may it be.